I'm David Torsivia. I'm Daniel Forkner. And this is Ashes, Ashes, a show about systemic issues, cracks in civilization, collapse of the environment, and if we're unlucky, the end of the world. But if we learn from all of this, maybe we can stop that. The world might be broken, but it doesn't have to be. Hi guys, I'm a recent listener of the podcast. I was drawn to it because I've always been interested in the systems of society and recently how they're failing. This probably isn't too great for my mental health, been dealing with the good old existential dread about impending collapse, but personally, I'd rather know than not know. I wanted to ask one thing though. Do you guys bring this up with family and friends? I'm having difficulty telling my own spouse because I don't want to just dump this on them. It's like, oh yeah, I've been a bit quiet lately, but don't worry, I'm just thinking about everything that's going to go tits up in the next few decades. It makes me sound nuts, and this in turn just makes me internalize all this stuff more, which I'm sure isn't good. How do you talk to ordinary people about this? It all feels so isolating. I'm a law and business student and have never really known what to do with my life, so I just kind of went along with the flow. At times, I'd be concerned about certain things in life or in the world, but I've always been surrounded by people who just shrug and say, you shouldn't care too much, just focus on the here and now, or what's it matter? It's not like you can do anything about it. But something about the lavish way of life we struggle to either obtain or sustain while burying our heads in the sand when confronted with the problem just really rubbed me the wrong way. When your university teachers and the required reading research papers dismiss every sort of corporate responsibility as a waste of stockholder value and recommend doing the bare minimum to prevent public outrage, when your housemate's ultimate goal is retiring at 40 and owning a Ferrari, and when everyone in your direct surroundings writes off every alarming piece of news as doesn't affect us, so it doesn't matter, and calls any kind of activist group a bunch of crazy folks, it's frustrating. It all felt very wrong and messed up to me. I'm sure you guys know the feeling, the loneliness of feeling like the world's gone mad and nobody cares about it. For a long time, I struggled with this disconnect between my surroundings and what was apparently actually going on in the world, but I couldn't muster the courage to truly seek out people who did care about something else than their immediate surroundings. That's around the time I found out about your podcast. Some commenter on Reddit recommended it. I can honestly say that you guys helped make a pretty big change in my life. To hear people not just care about societal issues, but carefully dissect and tackle difficult topics one at a time, it really helped me gain a more acute awareness of the world we live in. Since I started listening to your podcast, I've done my best to seek out books, documentaries, and academic works that talk about the issues we are facing and what we could do to improve our future world. I've even joined a political youth organization whose goals and vision are geared towards a sustainable future. And in turn, I found many other people who've gone through a similar kind of mental process that I have, and who are genuinely concerned about our planet and its inhabitants. So I'd like to thank you guys for what you've done and for the work you continue to do. I hope you'll continue making Ashes Ashes for a long time to come. It's having real, positive impact on people's lives. You've helped motivate me to dedicate my life, not to some vague notion of success, but to a better world for all of us, no matter how small the change I can personally make. Those were two emails that we received recently, almost uh, within days of each other, David. And both of these emails I can relate to, David. Um, You know, the first one talking about feeling isolated, not knowing how to discuss these things with the people around them. Uh, This is something I've gone through in the past before we started this podcast. Uh, And then that email from the second person saying, yeah, I was feeling isolated. Uh, I felt like I was crazy. All these people around me no one seemed to care or know about these things that I'm reading and learning about. But then this person decided to reach out to those around them, read more books, interact with more people, join an organization, right? And the more I read stories like this and the more I reflect on my own life, it seems that almost everyone who has to come to terms with the, the type of things that we talk about on this podcast of climate catastrophe, of environmental destruction, of the economic exploitation that goes on in almost every aspect of our lives, it seems that there is a very common emotional and psychological response that just about everyone experiences. The initial shock, the denial in some cases, the isolation, the depression, the existential dread, followed by 
perhaps a, a greater awareness of these things, coming to peace with them, and then learning how to connect with others. And then finally, you know, as that second email points out, making a change in one's own life. And so that brings us to the topic of today's episode, David. This is an episode that we've been putting off for a while because it's such a big topic to tackle, but it's something that is so incredibly important when we're reaching all these other de- depressing, difficult to swallow things that, w- that we discuss on this show. And when you come to terms with the state that the world is in, that the collapse that we're rapidly heading towards or find ourselves already in uh, in some areas, in some places, uh, it's a lot to handle. And uh, we all go through this this sort of grief process. Uh, there's a lot of grieving involved. Uh, you have to come to terms with the fact that, you know, people have been saying the world's going to end for <laughs> thousands of years at this point, but uh, this time might be different. And, and that's a lot to deal with, especially in a world that's as alienating and confusing and lonely as, as we have today. And that's just on the individual level. Coming out to other people, talking about this, uh, being that depressing person who's always going on about, well, did you hear about the floods here or the fact that all these animals are dead? It's it's even more isolating than we already find. And and for a lot of people, as they come to terms with this, it, it becomes an almost of a coming out process where, like you see in that first email that you read, Daniel, people aren't sure how to approach other people about this, how to talk about it. I know in my personal life, it's affected relationships when I'm going on and on about these depressing things and people don't have the bandwidth or emotional capacity at the moment because they're dealing with their own personal issues that we all have uh, to take on the sorrows of the world that I'm constantly spouting out. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been in this collapse community for over 10 years at this point, And over that time, I've, I've come to terms with this stuff. I've gone through my stages of grieving. I've reached, I think, that final acceptance level and I'm doing what I can. But it's a long, slow process, and lots of people who encounter this show or people that you might encounter as you explain things from this show are somewhere in that process, and, and understanding that and knowing how to talk to them and help them is a very important part of dealing with collapse, and that's what we're trying to address here today. It's interesting you mentioned it as like a coming out experience. That is actually kind of exactly how, how this happened to me. You know, in the early days of reading about climate change, about reading about the, the potential systemic collapse of society as we understand it. I remember being very depressed, definitely feeling very isolated. Um, and I was questioning what I was even doing in my own life. I was saying, why am I doing this work? You know, this doesn't really make sense. And there was a point where kind of in my, my feeling of desperate isolation, I reached out to someone in my family. I said, hey, I need to talk to you and tell you what's going on. And I actually broke down and, and, uh, and was crying a little bit saying, you know, I don't know how to deal with this. And 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 went on and on. And I look back at that now with a little bit, you know, feeling like, wow, you know, why was I so dramatic? And you forget when you're coming to terms with these things for the very first time, it's 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 extremely difficult. And now that I have come to terms with it, I've had to learn to be more sensitive with people around me because there was a time where it became more familiar to me and I would try to talk to my friends about these things. And I became known as like the doom and gloom guy, right? And this really rubbed me the wrong way. I was like, I'm not a doom and gloom guy. I'm just pointing out... <laughs> I'm just pointing out sea level rise. What's the big deal? You know, you know, how are we going to you know, change if we don't know these issues? But I've had to learn that people who are hearing these things for the first time don't have the, they're not equipped to, to deal with it. And I think there's a reason that we're not equipped to deal with it. And that's because in our society, there's a lot of denial about these systems, right, David? Of course. And so let's talk about denial for a moment and why we are so unequipped to even admit that these problems are happening right? Let alone deal with it in an emotionally healthy way. There's a 2018 paper titled Deep Adaptation, a map for navigating climate tragedy, written by Jim Bendel. He attempts to put the inevitable social collapse in the context of academic research. But what he writes about is very relevant to our own lives. And according to Bendel, the academic literature is largely silent on the possibility that we are headed towards collapse. He writes, quote, Have professionals in the sustainability field discussed the possibility that it is too late to avert an environmental catastrophe and the implications for their work? A quick literature review revealed that my fellow professionals have not been publishing work that explores or starts from that perspective. End quote. So in other words, very little if no research at all starts from the premise that uh, the collapse of society is inevitable. Rather, Those papers in the fields of sustainability that do focus on how we might adapt to climate change make the assumption 
that society will continue largely the same as it has been, but with some new way of going about irrigation or with a new understanding of carbon emissions, you know, these types of uh, micro incremental fixes, right? And a big reason so many of us, I think, are unequipped for these issues is because the models our society is formed through are largely in denial. When the very professionals whose entire lives are devoted to research, understanding and predicting change and offering solutions, when they still cling to the idea that catastrophe is avoidable through business as usual, technological tinkering, uh, you know, maybe voting in some new politicians, is it any wonder that we as just normal everyday people feel like we are the crazy ones for being afraid? We feel crazy because those with the institutional media and governmental power keep telling us that everything is fine while we look around us and see that <laughs> things are very much not fine. And this denial is not just an accident. In fact, a handful of scientists themselves, the ones on the forefront of climate research, feel it is unethical to share the realities of their findings. Here's another quote from that deep adaptation paper. A reaction of some environmentalists to a 2017 article predicting climate catastrophe did not focus on the accuracy of the descriptions or what might be done to reduce some of the worst effects that were identified in the article. Instead, they focused on whether such ideas should be communicated to the general public. Climate scientist Michael Mann warned against presenting the problem as unsolvable and feeding a sense of doom, inevitability, and hopelessness. Environmental journalist Alex Steffen tweeted that dropping the dire truth on unsupported readers does not produce action, but fear. In a blog post, Daniel Aldana Cohen, an assistant sociology professor working on climate politics, called the piece Climate Disaster Porn. Their reactions reflect what some people have said to me in professional environmental circles. The argument made is that to discuss the likelihood and nature of social collapse due to climate change is irresponsible because it might trigger hopelessness among the general public. I always thought it odd to restrict our own exploration of reality and censor our own sense making due to our ideas about how our conclusions might come across to others. And that's a lot to digest there in that quote. Um, and maybe this is why we get so much stuff that's always saying faster than expected, uh, more quickly than scientists predicted, mm -hmm. because they're always self-censoring their papers to be less extreme. But obviously, we here on Ashes Ashes wholeheartedly disagree with the idea that you should censor this information, that the people can't handle the truth, which, by the way, is enormously patronizing and disrespectful. It's very likely that what these scientists mean when they say they don't want to alarm the public is that they actually are just trying to not alarm themselves. Maybe they are the ones who are afraid to live in a world where we must confront the realities of our future and work towards something better. Maybe those scientists are afraid of giving up luxuries in their own lives that they have learned to take for granted. We are all stakeholders in this world, and the fact that there is a privileged few sitting in their literal ivy towers saying that, oh... The peasants down there aren't ready for this bad information <laughs> is so disrespectful to all of us because ultimately it's all of our world. It's not just the academics who are lying to us about how bad the situation is. And it, it, maybe if we'd been honest about this 20, 30 years ago, we could have done something. We could have kicked in the change that we so desperately needed. But now because they keep censoring themselves, limiting their results, making them more palatable, not only to us, but to politicians, to business owners, that we are in a place where the only options are drastic. There is no slow down reduction of carbon, of, of energy generation anymore. There are only dramatic options available to us if we want to uh, keep below two Celsius, one and a half Celsius, these point of no returns in the past that we just keep upping. And now realistically, we're looking at three, at four, at five, at seven. And this is because all this information has been censored and we have been denied the time and the sense of urgency to do something about it. Sorry, I got a little carried away there. <laughs> well, I was just thinking, this is always our problem, Dave. We try to like, like this is supposed to be an episode on how people can cope with this reality. But And here I am just like <laughs> rambling like a preacher. But we will, we will get to it. Uh, we promise. We just got to get through this first initial hump here. I, I do want to come back, though, uh, to something from that quote you read. This idea that oh, we don't want to alarm people because then they will feel hopeless. And people who are hopeless will have no motivation to work towards solutions. This is actually pretty common. According to writer Catherine Norlock, despair only sabotages a collective and productive response to climate change. And in her words, we should, quote, 
resist the temptation to single out groups of people as responsible for climate change and instead forgive those we think are guilty of environmental harm in order to maximize our ability to work together. End quote. <laughs> that sounds like someone really guilty, uh, what they would say. Everybody, listen up. I have an idea. Now, no one is to blame here. N- no one is to blame, right? My fossil fuel company. Uh, look, we don't need to point blame. Let's work together here. Come on, everybody. <laughs> We're the Exxon Mobil solution for climate change. Uh, there is no, no blaming for climate change. So let's all kumbaya and, and get going. And I think this idea that hopelessness paralyzes people kind of flies in the face of the human spirit. I didn't go in too much detail about my own experience earlier, but it was despair and hopelessness and that isolation I felt that caused me to break down in front of someone in my family. And it's also what motivated me to switch gears and seek out more meaningful work, right? Um, It just took time. And there's another perspective I want people to consider, which is, don't we want people to feel hopeless about our current system? I know I do. (laughs) That's because, David, much of our world today is inconceivably dumb. As we discussed in episode 63, Busy Work, perhaps half the entire population is engaged in work they consider pointless. They clock in at jobs for eight hours a day to do mindless work that they consider to have no value to society and through which they gain no useful skills, all so they can collect a meager sum of dollars which barely add up to their rent and debt payments. Why should people feel hopeful that this system is going to continue indefinitely. (laughs) Why would we even want that? If that system is threatened, then why not acknowledge it so we can put our hope in something better? In fact, uh, there's someone named Tommy Lynch who wrote an article in 2017 called Why Hope is Dangerous When It Comes to Climate Change. And according to him, being hopeful is more than useless. It can itself be destructive. I'm going to read that quote from uh, Tommy Lynch in just a second here, Daniel. Uh But um, I I really don't want to get started on hope in the climate change world and and just the ridiculous mistakes and and traps that people get caught because of it. And the collapse community, there's actually a word for it. They call it hopium uh, because the hope is used to make the masses not actually want to do any any change. And so they put their, their hope on the fact that technology or figures like Elon Musk will come in and save the day. And instead, they're just getting taken to the cleaners in that process. The problem gets made worse. And then here we are. But um, let me let me read this quote from Tommy Lynch. There are risks to embracing pessimism and fear. They are a necessary aspect of confronting our situation. Hoping that science will provide a solution is its own kind of surrender, relieving the pressure of confronting the ways of life that have given rise to climate change in the first place. The hope also downplays the fact that such solutions likely will entail living in a world marked by pain and suffering directly and indirectly caused by what we have done to nature. Hoping that science will provide a solution is its own kind of surrender, relieving the pressure of confronting the ways of life that have given rise to climate change in the first place. This hope also downplays the fact that such solutions likely will entail living in a world marked by pain and suffering directly and indirectly caused but what we have done to nature. These demands that we hope against all evidence are examples of what Lauren Berlant calls cruel optimism. Berlant describes the way people hope for something that is impossible or fantastical. What makes this cruel, rather than just tragic, is that the hope is itself part of the problem. Think of the way that dreams of success and wealth function in American society. Low-paid employees in precarious positions are told that determination and hard work will result in greater opportunities and economic security. In actuality, class mobility is very limited. The optimism at the heart of the American dream is cruel. Workers invest in a dream that actually leaves them more open to exploitation rather than challenging the wider economic system. So to continue on what I was saying before, Daniel, in the context of climate change, hope can be viciously cruel in that those who are more affluent will on average experience the consequences of climate change later than those who are part of the exploited and vulnerable classes, and of course, in a much lesser degree. Hope in some technological fix while we happily go about our lives is cruel, in that it prevents us from confronting the exploitative systems which created this problem in the first place and which have been and continue to destroy the lives of poor and vulnerable people all around the world. People are suffering right now all over this planet because of the hope that we have 
that 10 or 20 or 30 years down the line, some magic technology will be invented that will save the day and prevent the climate catastrophes that are already occurring all around the world from affecting us here in these wealthy developed nations in a way that we don't ever have to change the way that we live or interact or exploit the world. And that is cruel, not only to the people around the world who are suffering at this moment, not only to the thousands or millions of species of animals that will be extinct because of this choice, but also to our future generations who will have to pay the price of the debt that we're extracting from this exploitation of the earth, the life that lives upon it, and the suffering that, that, that we use to maintain the standard of living. But let's talk a little bit about <laughs> how, how we can uh, cope with this, David. Um, yes, let's. There's, there's an anthology titled Rebellious Morning, The Collective Work of Grief by Cindy Milstein, which I recommend to anyone who is struggling with anger, sadness, grief, dread, or any other complex emotion at, at what are these systemic injustices of our world. Uh, sounds like something you might want to read, David. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'd probably be healthy. <laughs> Um, But it's a collection of stories from people learning to live with this pain. Uh, Stories from the parents of the 43 students who were kidnapped and disappeared from a school in Mexico in 2014. Or stories from a Japanese woman on how communities in Japan are learning to live after the destruction that is continually wrought by the Fukushima nuclear power plant meltdown. These stories offer examples of ways to move forward in the face of large-scale pain. And climate change promises to deliver a lot of pain to this world. Cindy Milstein writes, quote, I come to this anthology through my own pain, yet it is inseparable from the pain of this world. I have traversed the worst, frequently alone. This pain laid bare much cruelty some of it systemic, some of it due to socialization. One of the cruelest affronts, though, was the expectation that pain should be hidden away, buried, privatized, a lie manufactured so as to mask and uphold the social order that produces our many unnecessary losses. When we instead open ourselves to the bonds of loss and pain, we lessen what debilitates us. We reassert life and its beauty. We open ourselves to the bonds of love, expansively understood. Crucially, we have a way together to at once grieve more qualitatively and struggle to undo the deadening and deadly structures intent on destroying us. And, and she, wrote, she writes that in uh, the intro to this anthology. And I want to read uh, just from one of these stories written by activist and artist Benji Hart. Uh, writing about their experience as a black person in America um, to help maybe give us some guidance on another way forward than this hiding of our pain. And I've put this quote together from different parts of uh, their story, so it's not contiguous, but uh, I think it all fits together. As the direct recipients of state violence in all its forms, police killings, mass incarcerations, school closings, and budget cuts, Many of us are able to get up in the morning, endure our daily lives, because we don't examine our oppression head on, at least not consistently. We understand and have even been taught that we cannot allow ourselves to feel the constant rage and pain we deserve to feel. It's unsustainable, and much of our community's conventional wisdom tells us it is not effective. It's depressing to realize that there is an entire network designed to harm us and shield those who do harm. It is demoralizing to comprehend how formidable the giant of empire is. And then my sadness is compounded with guilt. I am guilty for being sad. Sadness feels weak. I know in my head that the point of talking heads propaganda, the point of state murder, police acquittals, harassment and imprisonment is demoralization. I feel guilty for being demoralized. I should be angry. I should be fiery with unquenchable passion. I should be as relentless as the state. If I am sad, the state has won. If I am sad, the fight is over. The most intense violence, which we are seeing ramp up, the intentional erasure of history, the use of militaristic force and solitary confinement, the reneging of basic rights, 
and multifold acts of assault and abuse will never stop our communities from feeling. It will never end our love for our own lives, for the lives of our ancestors and our children. It will never dissuade us from fighting back. Pretending I am not sad, hiding my pain, will not make me stronger. In fact, suppressing my true self, ignoring the fear and rage that surround loss is exactly what in the long run will weaken me. When we talk of self-care, self-defense, and self-preservation, we need to talk not about overcoming our feelings of grief, but allowing them, making room for them. We need to talk about movement building that allows us to feel in all the different ways that may come and does not expect us to erase or bottle up our sadness in the name of organizing leadership or action. Let grief be part of the movement building process for which we allow hallowed space and let it build within us the compassion, wisdom, and rage that propel us into new battles. And what that quote means to me, David, is there's power in allowing our emotions to be felt. Yes, uh, you know, the thought that climate catastrophe might, you know, render parts of our country uninhabitable, it may drive internal refugees, the external climate destruction outside of our country is going to drive refugees into our countries, you know, the food systems that prop up modern civilizations may start to fail, leaving us wondering where our next meals will come from. Yes, this may happen, and that that thought is 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 terrifying. But we should engage with that. We should allow these emotions to play out. We should feel angry at the forces that are making that happen. We should feel indignant at the at the media and the the governments that tell us that they're working on solutions when in fact they're not. And through feeling that, we can build communities. We can build connections to others. We can start to bridge the gaps between uh, the isolation that so many of us have been pushed into. And that's what's going to give us strength. And we're going to talk later in the show about some practical things we can do from things we can learn from the prepper community, but also practical ways to build community so that when these destructive forces enter our lives, we have the ability to work around them and maybe even move past them, maybe even thrive. Uh, I, I have to laugh just for one second, Daniel, the thought that government is doing anything, at least here in the United States. I don't know if you just saw that press release the U.S. just put out about how uh, important it is that we export uh, gas and natural gas around the world. Going so far as to call it, um, the gas itself molecules of freedom. Yeah. Yes, I did see that. So uh, I, don't, I don't know how much help we're getting from that. And as ridiculous and onion-like as it is, and as much as I laugh on it, it really should, instead of making us giggle and, and look how stupid these people are, we should just be angry that they're, yeah. they consider us so dumb that we, <laughs> we would be tricked by the fact that gas is actually a molecule of freedom. I mean, Jesus. But I don't want to get too far away on that, especially when we have such eloquent writing here. Uh, there's another quote from uh, Jim Bindle in the Deep Adaptation paper that I think is relevant and I'd like to read. The implication is for you to take a time to step back, to consider what if the analysis in these pages is true, to allow yourself to grieve and to overcome enough of the typical fears we all have to find meaning in new ways of being and acting. That may be in the fields of academia or management or could be in some other field that this realization leads you to. And that's the end of that quote. I mean, this is sort of what happened to you. Daniel, I mean, this deep adaptation paper wasn't out yet. Well, you were going through all this stuff uh, because I've been pestering you with it for years. But I mean, you did sort of come to terms with this. You did grieve and, and you changed your field. You're looking into other things. You're working now in nonprofits. You're trying to get into agricultural stuff at the moment. Um, if anybody has some sweet farm jobs up in Massachusetts, let Daniel know. Mm hmm. But this was a, like a radical change that was motivated through the fact that you realizing that your current way of life is unsustainable. And this is something that we all have to come to terms with, even those of us who are very aware and, and who are trying to live the most conscious lives that we can. Uh, you know, you change out your light bulbs, you drive less, you maybe sell your car, you try not to fly, you ride a bike a lot. Um, all these things we do that we're told to do to take on the massive global responsibility of climate change as an individual. And then at some point it clicks to us that, wait, this is not enough. These little changes that I'm making, you know, yeah, they're helping, 
But if we want to really make a dent in this, if we want to reverse these trends, then we have to have larger cultural, societal shifting changes in the way that we live. And so much of our society is built around work, around how we interact with each other, that if we want to kick off that jump, then it really has to start there. And that's what these papers are encouraging. That's what you found that right. is, 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 is an option for you. And I realize not everybody can do this. Not all of us have the luxury of, you know, Daniel, you're like a young, childless person who doesn't own a house. Um, you're relatively free in the fact that you can travel wherever you need to. You don't have a family that you need to support. So you're in a, in a place of privilege that allows you to just really flip the script very quickly. Mm hmm. But the fact of the matter is, is the precarity of our position that everybody finds themselves in where, you know, I have to make sure that I can put food on the table, that I need to be able to pay my mortgage, that I need to make sure that I have a roof over my head. This precarity that our economy is built upon, that the exploitation of the West is built upon, uh, is the banality of evil that we find ourselves in. Because through the exploitation, the fact that each and every one of us is forced to do these things that we maybe don't want to or ethically don't agree with and know that, you know, I'm not working in a field that's helpful. I'm hurting, but that's okay because, you know, it's it's only a little bit that I'm, I'm making a, a difference and I still need to provide for myself. That's what allows these little things to add up into big bits of evil. Um, nobody's out there. Well, most people aren't out there at least, you know, trying to burn down the world. Uh, but all of our collective actions absolutely, unfortunately, do. But it's not entirely our fault. Like, yeah, you know, some of us can go off the grid and live these like pure hermetic lives, but most of us don't have that option. But we're forced into this because what what is the alternative? We starve. We we're homeless. Mm -hmm. This is what we say when we when we're talking about the fact that we need societal shifts, that we need to totally redo how we address every aspect of our culture because the way it's set up right now is we're primed to be exploited and that exploitation so often leads to evil. It leads to climate destruction. It leads to exploitation of the natural systems around our world as well as the people who depend upon them. I mean, you talk about privilege. Like, you know, one thing I'm considering in Massachusetts is finding a service job, like a service position in agriculture so I can kind of get my foot in the door. And I think about you know, someone who has student debt, right? Like the very fact that I could volunteer on a farm for just room and board is a privilege because I don't have student debt. And, and imagine someone that has $100,000 hanging over their head and says, well, I would love to volunteer on a farm, but guess what? If I don't do that, I can't put food on the table. And therefore that's why I work in the software industry, or that's why I do this work that, you know, maybe isn't meaningful or, or maybe even worse than that is harmful to this world. Because I don't have a choice. That's the exploitation you're talking about. But I love what Jim Bendel said in that quote you read, which is, we have to ask the question. You know, we have to ask the question, what if? And we have to examine this in the context of our own lives and see where that realization might possibly lead us. Because a, a better world will require community. It will require systems in which all of us can work together. And there are so many ways that we can each contribute Right? Maybe I have the luxury to, to go work on a farm, but someone else who works in software, maybe they can contribute to a better world by helping us set up a Creative Commons website where we can you know, disperse knowledge and information like that farm hack website that you talked about last week. Right? I think if we each examine our own lives with honesty, we can realize, number one, that we're not alone. And number two, that there's always a way that we can move forward towards feeling that we're making a, a better world possible. Well, then let's talk about some practical ways that we can, you know, cope with this, that we can make a better world, that we can prepare for the catastrophes that are coming. Um, I think the practical conversation here is important because we do talk a lot of theoretical things, uh, systemic problems. Uh, but this is a show that's really about coping. And coping takes both, like we mentioned, a practical form where it might just be, hey, let's make sure that we have some extra food in case there are food shortages, to the emotional aspect of, well, how can I deal with the fact that I'm grieving for the world, for the seven and a whatever it is, billion people on it, and the countless billions of animals that live all around us. I think we have to comment on the prepper lifestyle, David. Full disclosure, I have lots of, like, I have some boxes of food, and I have some, uh, like, crates of water and stuff stashed in various places in my, in my apartment, so... um. I am sympathetic to it. Let's not, I, I just want to fully 
get that out there <laughs> before we jump into this. Well, David, let me be clear. I don't disagree with any of that. In fact, I think what you're doing is good. I think all of us should do that. You know, I have some cans of dried food that probably wouldn't be enough, but there's nothing wrong with, the, with preparedness, right? But I specifically want to address just one of the mentalities that frequents this prepper mindset. And we were actually sent in the mail a book by an author named Joe Ordia. It's called Built to Survive. I uh, haven't finished reading the entire book yet, but Joe is a former military contractor who deployed to Iraq with the U.S. military. Uh, and his experience made him realize that we here in America are not prepared for a collapse of the infrastructure that makes modern life possible. In fact, his core fear is that the power grid in the U.S. will be attacked by either China or Russia. And because of the fragility of the power grid, which we actually go in depth about in episode 13, Lights Out, much of the country would lose access to electricity, food, water, and municipal services. And so for this reason, Joe decided to build a house that could survive off the grid. Now, uh, most of his book is organized by practical steps that someone can follow to do the same. That is, you know, how to design a house with a backup generator and solar power in mind, how to ensure clean drinking water in the event the water treatment plant becomes offline, what kinds of central air systems to consider, and of course, how to keep everything secure. And again, I don't have any problem with much of these practical measures. It's, it is a good idea to take steps toward preparedness in your own life and for possible interruptions or breakdowns of modern services and infrastructures. But I want to just hone in for a second on this emphasis on the need for security. The premise of this book is that in the event of a natural disaster or an act of war that brings down the grid, life will suddenly become very dangerous and people will become violent. From the foreword of this book, here's Joel Skuzen writing, quote, Social unrest will tend to move outward from the urban areas, and so living at the outer edges of suburbia buys you time to get ready, as suburban areas closer to town absorb much of the pillaging. End quote. And so for this reason, this idea that this kind of lawlessness will encourage pillaging and violence, Joe provides a roadmap for people to continue participating in their professional urban lives by moving to the suburbs where they can commute to the city and then retreat to the secure, self-sufficient home they've built when the violence starts. He's heavy on recommendations for becoming firearm proficient, for installing sensors along your property line to watch out for intruders, installing your solar panels on the back of your property so your house is less conspicuous to you know, would-be invaders. And again, I want to be clear, we don't have criticisms for those who recommend preparedness. And in fact, Many of his recommendations are good ones. And yes, it would not hurt us to even consider the possibility that people with malicious intent would want to disrupt our communities. But the criticism here, and really the main reason actually we started this show in the first place, David, like the entire show, it has to do with the recommendations that are left out and the implication that modern life is only safe to the extent that police officers are present. And the moment things go south, well, people will just start cannibalizing each other. I think these implications drive people into what we might call a bunker mentality, right? right? Believing that their only hope of survival is to stockpile a bunch of canned food, hunker down with a bunch of guns and ammo, and uh, prevent anyone from coming near. <laughs> it's, um, it's funny that you mentioned that this is you know, one of the genesis moments of the show, because it really was... Like I mentioned earlier in the, the show, I've been in the collapse world, uh, reading, writing for all, over a decade at this point. And so much of that conversation has always really been dominated by these, these like uh, hard right wing, you know, former military guys who are talking about like the best way to collect all this stuff in their house and hide it from their neighbors and have plans of how to like bug out to whatever location they are and, and like go on these fantasies about how they could kill all their neighbors if they were trying to come in and take their stuff and just like this really weird perverse thing and it sort of bled a lot into the collapse community as well where people weren't so much interested in what is causing the collapse or how to stop it but more so as when is it going to be here and when can I start killing people um and uh, I don't want to like say that it's the only thing that the community was about, but there always has been a really big focus on, well, after 
the end of the world as we know it, Teotihuacan. I think that's how you say that. Uh, when is it going to happen here? When can I start art doing this this stuff? And it well, there was a lot of like feedback too, where people were like super into the zombie fiction, imagining you know playing zombie games, imagining what they would do in a zombie apocalypse because that is a acceptable way to murder your neighbors. Uh, if they're a zombie rather than, than whatever. But it, it, it's a very alienated, isolated, non-community-driven way of, of looking at the end of the world. And it's built on all these assumptions, like you mentioned, Daniel, that like are mentioned in the foreword of this book, that, that immediately people are going to be running around, like attacking each other, that uh, the world is going to be filled with cannibals and Mad Max stuff. There used to be a, a very famous guy in one of the collapsed communities I frequent. His name was Fishma Boy, and he was always predicting that within six months, uh, global dimming was going to end and we were all going to be eating each other, cannibalizing whoever we can get our hands on. And, and these tropes existed for so long that there was no no counter to it, no focus on, well, you know, what alternatives do we have? How can we stop this? And that was why we kicked up this show off in large part, to be a reasonable deep dive on the things that are leading up to collapse rather than saying, this is the date, this is how you prepare, you know, this is the best gun, this is the best backpack, blah, 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 blah. And also as a way to provide an alternative way forward once that eventual collapse, you know, however it plays out actually does happen. Uh, an alternative that doesn't involve this bunker mentality, but one that involves working together. And, and to be fair, the author of this book He's very much about security so that he can protect his family. That's all well and good. In fact, I did find one place where he mentions community. On page 153, he writes, quote, It's important to have a security plan ready to go in the event that a grid-down situation continues for an extended period. Chaos has taken over, and law enforcement cannot be counted upon. Sensors around your property can help, but keep in mind that once a threat has arrived close to your home, it may be too late to avoid disaster. That's why your security plan and procedure ought to extend well beyond your property line, meaning it will be important to know your neighbors and to have worked out a plan with them, perhaps to include neighborhood patrols. End quote. And I am happy that he mentions here the need to build networks of people beyond your property line. But I do feel like the emphasis is still on models around this bunker mentality. You know, that knowing your neighbors is useful to the extent that you can collectively keep outsiders out. And I want to make a suggestion. What if instead of building neighborhoods and personal bunkers that are useful at keeping people out, what if we built communities that were useful at not just absorbing newcomers and those in need, but actively using them to better those communities? So I would like you to consider two hypothetical situations. All right, hypothetical situation number one, your city has collapsed. Uh, no trucks are bringing food to town and the water treatment plant shut down. So you and your friend, you're forced to leave. And after several tough days of hunger and thirst, you arrive at a former suburban neighborhood. But before you even have the chance to speak, a group of men with shotguns approach you and they say, stop right there. You're not coming in here. Yes, we may have a year's worth supply of canned vegetables, but those are for us. And if you take another step forward, you're dead. All right, I want you all to consider that scenario and think about how you might feel in that situation. All right, hypothetical situation number two. Same story. Uh, city collapses, uh, you're hungry, you're thirsty, and finally you reach a neighborhood. This time, you're met by a small group of men, women, and children holding not shotguns, but shovels. And one of them says to you, oh, hi there. You look hungry and thirsty. Well, the food team is preparing a meal for tonight, which will include the tomatoes that Jim's garden produces, the potatoes that Barbara's garden grows, and the eggs that are collected from the chickens that the chicken team has been taking care of. You're welcome to join us, but we're a community here and everyone must pull their weight. We have a water team that's bringing in fresh water from a well about a mile away, and they could use a hand. Or if you like, we're organizing able bodies to help construct a community shelter uh, where we hope to install bunk beds for newcomers like you. So consider that scenario and think how you might feel. And next, consider which community is most likely to be attacked, which is at a, a, a higher risk of violence. 
In the first one, there's a bunch of surplus food being guarded. And in the second one, there is a steady supply of food, but only daily and only if a large number of people go to work each day to ensure that the animals, gardens, and land are all taken care of. I don't know, David, which one do you think is more likely to be uh, under siege? Well, I know the first one sounds way less fun. He wants to sit inside eating canned soup for a year. That's a good way to get scurvy. But uh, you make a good point there in that if somebody, if you have to have just a collection of food that lasts for a year, um, it's very simple for someone to come in and, and kill you and take your stuff. But if you have a farm or something that needs to be actively worked, it takes uh, community knowledge to keep it running and producing. If somebody might think they can come in and, and kick you out or take control of it, but they'll quickly realize that that's not the case. And uh, it's safer to be uh, in a situation where you are important, where your presence and continued uh, health and freedom is an important component to the fact that the food keeps coming out and uh, helping everybody in that. Uh, you sort of create a protection, not of ceramic plates or whatever, but one of uh, dependence on the community. And then, of course, th- there's this notion that people become violent towards one another in time of crises. And I think that's one that, and I think that's a premise we should also just be questioning from the onset. You know, I don't think that's even true. Uh, right there was these stories that came out after Hurricane Katrina. They came out uh, a couple years or so after the event that countered the media portrayal of communities in Louisiana at the time of the hurricane. Right, we saw a lot of images on TV of people looting. Um, the media loved to paint these pictures of of violent young men breaking into stores, doing all these violent things. But then we later found out when you actually looked at what was happening, is that people were, yes, they were breaking into storefronts, but they were doing so that, they, so that they could get food and medicine and water for the people that they cared about. They were doing so to protect the children. They were doing so to take care of those who were in need. And in fact, the violence that happened, happened at the hands of law enforcement and other actors of the state. In fact, there, there's, a, a, there's an article that was published by The Atlantic called Finding Solidarity in Disaster, published in 2015. And I'll just read, uh, let me just find maybe something quick I can read from it. Um, quote, violence on the ground too turned out to be much less common than imagined. I kept hearing the word animal and I didn't see animals. A woman named Denise Moore told the public radio program This American Life about her time at the Superdome. Instead, she saw self-organized activities by gangster guys who broke into abandoned stores. Although they might have looked like looters, they were salvaging fresh clothes for those who needed them, juice for the babies, water, beer for the older people, food, raincoats so that they could all be seen by each other. Meanwhile, it was sometimes the armed agents of the state, the very people who were supposed to keep the peace, who violently impeded rescue. When two black families tried to cross uh, a bridge to find medical and other supplies, they were met by New Orleans police officers touting guns. The cops on the bridge killed two unarmed men and injured four others. All told, 11 civilians were shot by police in Katrina's aftermath. Police and soldiers broke up the self-organized solidarity built by people stuck in the city. Larry Bradshaw and Lori Beth Slonsky Two paramedics visiting New Orleans for a conference recalled a group of people banding together to find food and shelter, only to be lied to by the police who knocked down their makeshift shelters and blocked their route out of the city. We were hiding from possible criminal elements, they wrote, but equally and definitely, we were hiding from the police and sheriffs with their martial law, curfew, and shoot-to-kill policies. End quote. And if that is how the state will respond in times of crisis, then, it's, then now is the time for us to start building those groups of solidarity. Now is the time to start building communities. Now is the time to start putting into plans. Okay, when the food runs out, what are we going to do? Who can we rely on? Who, what kind of structure can we create to take people in and to help us? Because what other choice do we have? So David, what can we do? What are some practical steps we can take to prepare ourselves both in the present and the future for what could be 
the collapse of life as we know it. Well, there's a wide variety of stuff here, Daniel. I mean, we have both physical uh, activities that we can do as, as well as uh, things that help and treat our mental and emotional state. I mean, if you want to take the prepper approach, there are a lot of good things in the community. Uh, you know, keep a few weeks worth of water in your house. Keep a few weeks worth of non-perishable food in your house for everybody in there. Um, make sure you have some cash set aside if, if, if the cashless machines go out. You know, all these things that are very practical and uh, don't even have to be about collapse, but could just be about local calamity. Where, you know, there's a natural disaster or a, the power grid goes down or, or something that might leave you outside of your regular way of life for a few weeks or possibly months. That's happened to some people who suffered from the recent hurricanes in places like Puerto Rico in the southeastern United States, uh, where life is still getting back to the way things were at this point months or years later. Being prepared for a few weeks out is not a crazy thing to do. It's just practical. Um, it also gives you some sort of cushion in case something traumatic happens to your family financially. You will have food for a little while until you can figure things out, get back on your feet. It's just smart to be ready. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. And it doesn't have to suffer from the prejudice that the prepper community so often gets uh, from people who aren't prepared. I don't know what's wrong with being prepared, but for some reason, people laugh at that. And maybe it's because some people, you know, are just so ridiculous with it. So that's a good start. Um, knowing things yourself, increasing your own skills and training is another great way. Uh, CPR, um, first aid certification. Uh, there are in the United States, oftentimes you'll find your local government probably has a disaster preparedness course where you can go and take it and you'll come away with like a hard hat and a bag of goodies and with like flashlights and stuff in it. Many communities have this. It's done by the federal government. Uh, you can uh, then become a member of this response team if you want. You can be someone literally on the ground helping in these situations if they ever get to that point. At the very least, you'll receive some great training. Um, if you're in a major city, you could look for uh, street medics or action medic training. Uh, they can get you caught up on, on how to respond to things in the moment. Uh, that's a great way to do it. If you're more serious, there's lots of volunteer EMT services that you can get trained and ultimately get your EMT certification, which is something that is cool and, and might be useful in these types of things. There are books. There are texts on this. There's a great book where there is no doctor. If you are the type of person who is anxious about going out and getting trained, this is a great book to read at home and to learn things and just has as a reference on your shelf. But these are, you know, very practical things, Daniel. And um, they're still like very much the lone wolf thing. And I think most people would be better served is finding a group of like-minded people that they can share these thoughts with, that they can learn about these type of stuff. And also just forge these community bonds and relationships that are an important part of being a person and being a healthy and happy person. This could be something as simple as finding a local community garden where you can learn how to farm on a small scale and, and get some tasty food out of this, as well as just hang out with people who care about the earth, who care about agriculture, who care about uh, sustainable practices. That's a great way to jump into this world. Like the listener in the very beginning of this episode who wrote us that email, you can get involved in activist organizations. There are so many on so many topics that you can find whatever you care about, a bunch of like-minded people who not only care, but are willing to do something about it. And that's the type of people you want to surround yourself with. I know in my activist groups, I'm constantly inspired by people that I encounter who are just doing so much to try and make the world better, who always seem to find more and more of their own time, who have more to give not for themselves, but for everyone around them. And, and I find that personally inspiring. I've made some great friends in this process, and uh, I know I have a community I can count on, but also they drive me to be better. And I always appreciate that fact. But a lot of this still, you know, we, we talked in the beginning about how collapse and talking about collapse so often for people is a coming out process. You can't just go up to someone and say, hey, you know, the world is ending. I'm sad about this. Um, but most people aren't ready for that. It's too much for them. And, and you can share this show. You can share all these articles uh, that we post on our very social media accounts that deprime people, get them ready for that conversation. But fact of the matter is, it's a lot for people to take. And there are spaces online um, that are aimed at people who are looking for community support in the collapse world, because sometimes it helps to talk to other people who understand what you're going through. 
who understand and have the same worldview as you do, who realize just how deep in the shit we are. And there's a lot of value in that. You can form a small support affinity groups. We have a great community here on our Discord. We haven't formalized any sort of therapy or support uh, system, but it might be worth talking about. There's a common method now where you find a group of six or seven people, um, including yourself, and everyone, you know, throw them in a group chat, throw them in a Discord server room, whatever. And with six or seven people, you know, someone is probably always going to be online. Someone probably is always going to be there to talk. And you can find these people in in our Collapse Discord community. You can find them on the Collapse subreddit. There is a subreddit on Reddit called uh, Collapse Support. And they have a Discord that are specifically aimed at helping people make it through this process. Understand that there is not only a global cost to the the actions that we have that are, are destroying our world, but also an individual cost. Not necessarily, you know, in terms of a destroyed home, but in the stress and the anxiety and the the grief that we suffer learning about this and being aware of it and, and being aware of our own contribution to these problems. So finding people in that, and they don't necessarily all have to be collapsed people. Even if you want to set one of these up with your with your friends that you already talk to about maybe emotional things, this is a great thing to formalize and say, you know, here is our support chat. Uh, Here's our support group. And you have a bad day, you know, text us and somebody will respond. You're suffering because you just read something awful. Uh, You you saw a video of walruses falling off cliffs or you heard about half the fruit bats in Australia dying in a day. And do you want to talk because it's sad? Because watching the world burn down around us is sad. You know, this is a place that you can go and do that and find people who understand what you're saying and and they can tell you, you know, yeah, it is sad and it's okay to feel sad. It's okay to feel angry at the people that allowed this to happen. And it's okay to take that anger and process it and and cry and yell and, and punch something and then utilize that energy towards doing something, you know, joining one of these groups, getting trained, making a difference, telling somebody about this and bringing them into this larger awareness of what's happening and the fact that they cannot depend on the hopium that is the technological revelations that were constantly promised that never arrive, but instead need to face the fact that if they want change, if they don't want this to happen in greater and greater numbers, in larger and larger magnitudes, then they're going to have to change their lives. You can't change anybody's life for them. They have to decide to do that. But you can put that little idea in their head and let it grow. And and every time that happens, we get one step closer to building that better world that we really want to focus on doing in this show and to building these communities that allow that kind of change to happen and foster. And a community doesn't have to just be, you know, like a community garden or or, or a local place, but they can be these digital uh, collections of people who are there for each other. And a community can be a website. It can be a, a group chat. It can be... A, a garden. It can be a group of people who meet once a month or or once a year even. Just people coming together and and un- acknowledging, you know, that we're all humans in this, that our relationships do matter. That's an important part about making sure that we don't feel isolated, that we don't feel alone in this, because that loneliness, that feeling of separation is what is so dangerous in this collapsed despair. But you're not in it alone. I mean, you're here. Send us an email. We can always talk to you. We can point you in the right direction. Come join our Discord. There's a link on our website. People up here on on the chat will frequently come in and vent about something awful that happened to them. And and people from all around the world will will respond and say, that's okay. It happened to me too. Here's what I did. It'll be it'll get better. Or maybe it won't get better, but you know, we understand we're here for you. And that's helpful. I think some people some people fall into the trap of asking what's the point? When we start pondering such ideas like climate change, you know, destroying life as we know it, it's so easy to allow nihilism and this, this kind of apathy set in. And we have to remember, though, that whatever the future will bring, we have lives to live right now. There are people beside us that need us and or could use our help. We have joy and happiness to experience right now, regardless of what's going to happen in the future. I remember reading Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, a long time ago. Uh, Viktor Frankl was a concentration camp victim and Holocaust survivor. And in his book, one of the things he wrote was along the lines of, people are always asking, what is the meaning of life? What is my purpose? But what we don't realize is that life is the one asking us that question. 
and we answer it through the way we choose to live our lives. And in addition, he writes about the emotional reactions of people living in concentration camps and that no matter how bad things got, each individual still had a choice. Quote, We who lived in concentration camps can remember the men who walked through the huts comforting others, giving away their last piece of bread. They may have been few in number, but they offer sufficient proof that everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. The way in which a man accepts his fate and all the suffering it entails, the way in which he takes up his cross, gives him ample opportunity, even under the most difficult circumstances, to add a deeper meaning to his life. Here lies the chance for a man either to make use of or to forego the opportunities of attaining the moral values that a difficult situation may afford him. And this decides whether he is worthy of his sufferings or not. End quote. We each have a choice, and in the face of existential crisis, we can still choose hope, we can still choose love, we can still find meaning and purpose, and no matter how bad things get, None of us are alone in this struggle. We briefly railed against hope earlier on this episode and the dangers that it can have. And I, I know throughout this show how much I come across as a pessimist, but I'm really not. I'm, I'm, I'm really, truly and honestly driven by hope and optimism. And yes, there's a realistic component that the earth is really fucked right now. And, and our culture and our society is incredibly gross and 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 damaging and exploitative and just broken on a fundamental systemic level but it would be easy if i was a pessimist just to say well look how broken this is like who cares i'm just gonna live my life and and, and that's it and I'll, I'll try and exploit it whatever ways i can that benefit me but in the end of the day there's nothing that can be done but that's not what I think. That's not what I'm driven by. I, I am driven by a hope that things can get better, that we can build something better, that this isn't the only way the world has to be run, that there can be a better future, that, that if we had the imagination to step outside and say, you know, the world wasn't always like this and it doesn't have to be like this just because that's the way it is right now. If we can find that independence from the status quo. And liberate people's imagination and remind them, you know, things can get better. They, we, we can have an equitable, a fair, sustainable earth for everyone. Humans, the developed world, the developing world, the animals and, and ecosystem life that we depend upon literally for everything. It, it absolutely is possible. And I can imagine and sometimes I can close my eyes and I, I, I try and visualize it because I think that's important and I can see it there. And that's what drives me. This is a form of hope. But I've used this hope not to say that you know somebody will come in and save the day. There will there'll be aliens or technology that will fix all these problems and I can keep living in this broken world. But rather, it's hope that everyone wakes up and realizes that things don't have to be this way. They can be better. And that is absolutely attainable. I don't know if I'll ever see it in my life. I hope that I will. I don't know if I will. But at the very least, whatever children are being born right now, whose future are being violently stolen from them by people who decide to use terminology like molecules of freedom, who insist that climate change is not a problem, who continue to build these exploitative systems. Yes, this is violence being committed onto those children by those people, and we should respond accordingly in whatever self-defense that we need to. But, but I hope that we realize that this doesn't have to be this way. And I really think that the spirit of humans, the realization that we all have in our heart that something is broken in this world, that the things that give us anxiety day to day, that make us feel alienated and separated, that we don't necessarily have the words for because we aren't taught the correct ways to deal with our emotions or to deal with humans, or, or, or especially here in the West and in, in America, where everything's been hyper-individualized and we've lost the connection that we used to have, that we still have this spirit within us, and the deep part of our soul that says something's better and it's obtainable. And if we just reach out and find that in each and every one of us, then we can build that better world. And we're so close of that bursting out. I, I can almost feel it. 
And I, every single time somebody writes this to the show, when I share it, when I hear somebody repeat something back to me that we we mentioned, I feel like we're chipping away at that little exterior and, and getting closer. And, and all of you who go out and spread these things, not even in the context of the show, but just in a vision for a better, equitable future, you're doing your part too. And I guess if there's one thing that, that we can take away from all of this and in, in what can we do, and not just in the terms of this episode, but in the grander, larger scheme of everything, it's, it's that. And that's how we build a better world. A lot to think about, David. Think about it and do something about it. We hope you will. We would like to thank associate producers for this episode, John Fitzgerald and Chad Peterson. These are our second and third associate producers of this show. And we'd also like to thank our first anonymous associate producer who is with us for the months of March and April. If you would like to know what an associate producer is or would consider being one, you can find that on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash ashes ashes cast. And as always, a lot of time and research goes into making these episodes possible, and we will never use ads to support this show. So if you like it, would like us to keep going, you, our listener, can support us by giving us a review, recommending us to a friend, or, or visiting us on that Patreon page. And you can also send us an email. You can find us at contact at ashesashes.org. Share your thoughts, share your stories. We read them and we appreciate them. Another way you can support us and we can actually help support you is by helping us with our transcripts. We have these machine translated transcripts on our website, uh, but we'd love to convert them into perfect human readable form. Uh, we have a little bit of money that we can pay for each one of these. If you're interested, please send us an email at contact at ashesashes.org. But our website is also filled with lots of other information as well as these transcripts, including a full source for every single one of our episodes, more information on each show, and uh, links to all of our social media networks, which typically are Ashes Ashes Cast. There's also a link to our Discord community on there. We encourage you to come out find the support that you need, and be a member of what is a growing and beautiful collapse-aware community. Next week, we have another great show coming up, this time turning towards the climate and the ways that we move about, and we hope you'll tune in for that. But until then, this is Ashes Ashes. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.